All right, so I have 7.30. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome to everybody, and welcome to the Navigating the Pediatric Lupus Journey webinar series, part one. This is a four-part series. Um, our first part here is titled, What to Expect? And the upcoming series um, has three additional parts to it. The next one will be in early December called Digging into the Details, which will provide a more in-depth look at uh, lupus. In early February, in February, March, early next year, we will have Managing Life as a Young Adult. So that'll talk to, speak to, um, as we you know, morph into that transition from pediatric to adult lupus and all that's wrapped around that. And then part four will be next spring called Living Your Best Life, which will really take a holistic approach to living with lupus. So watch for details, watch for emails from your local chapter um, for more information about that. And just a few housekeeping notes. First of all, we're thrilled to have you join us here in this, in this new series with us. Um, we'll start out a presentation with Dr. Sandy Burnham in just a moment, followed by our panel discussion. Um, if you have questions during the panel, please use the chat feature. We do have somebody monitoring the chat and uh, we'll take those questions as, as, they, as they come up and appropriate in the, during the presentation. Uh, please know that we're not able to take very specific questions regarding uh, specific individual diagnosis or treatment options. Uh, there will be contact information for both our chapter and you can certainly refer back to your own local um, LFA chapter, uh, but also uh, Dr. Burnham will be sharing some information about how to contact CHOP, uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, our local institution here, if um, you'd like to reach out directly to them. And uh, we are recording this webinar, so you'll, uh, you'll get a copy of this. You'll be able to access a copy of it on your local chapter, uh, LFA chapter's website. And you'll also likely get an email with a link to that um, after, as a participant in this program. So um, with that, what I'd like to do is get started. And I'm honored and really pleased to, to work with Dr. John, we call him Sandy Burnham. Burnham. So when you go to, to look him up, you might see his name as Sandy or as John, but I'm really pleased to introduce him to you. Dr. Berman is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics in the Division of Rheumatology at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, we call it CHOP, and the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. He currently is the Clinical Director and Director of Quality, Quality and Patient Safety in the Division of Rheumatology. He is the Director of the CHOP Lupus Program and Co-Director of the Lupus Integrated Nephritis Clinic. Dr. Burnham is actively involved in quality improvement initiatives at CHOP and nationally and studies care delivery in children with juvenile idiopathic arthritis and lupus. He has worked collaborative, collaboratively to develop clinical pathways to diagnose, treat Kawasaki disease and MIS-C and prevent acute adrenal insufficiency in children treated with chronic steroids. His work to oper operationalize treat to target in juvenile idiopathic arthritis Serves, uh, served as the model for implementation in the Pediatric Rheumatology Care and Outcomes Improvement Network at sites across the U.S. and Canada. He is now working to develop and implement the Pediatric Lupus Care Index, a composite tool to measure the quality of care with a focus on outcome measurement and comor comorbidity assessment and prevention. He is the CHOP site, site PI and PR for, of PR Coin. COIN, and serves as the co-chair of the PR COIN Outcomes Committee. In addition to inter internal funding, he has received funding from the National Institutes of Health, the Rheumatology Research Foundation, and is the recipient of the 2018 CHOP Master Clinician Award. Dr. Burnham, thank you for being with us tonight. We're honored and privileged, and I'm so pleased to work with you on an ongoing basis. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Take it away. Sure. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank you, Cindy, as well as Amy. Ander from the Heartland chapter and Terry Iman from the uh, Georgia chapter, as well as the parents who made this discussion possible. I also want to thank all of you for joining us, and I look forward to learning from you uh, during this program. In the next 10 minutes or so, I plan to discuss some quick basics about lupus and also discuss some themes gleaned from discussions with many families grappling with a new diagnosis of lupus uh, in a child. Next slide. This is a picture from way back when in September 2001 with a young woman whose lupus diagnosis had a major impact on me and looking back provided a lot of motivation uh, to work hard on these kids behalf. Uh, she was one of my first patients with lupus and really taught me how difficult the journey can be for so many kids and their families. 
First off, the diagnostic journey can be long and very frustrating. Then it can be painful adjusting to a new diagnosis. It's a lot to handle for anyone and it takes a team. So what does adjustment mean? It means accepting the diagnosis and the need for treatment, adapting the whole family's life to account for these new and unfamiliar healthcare demands, um, dealing with the social, educational, and financial impact, and living with a new and unanticipated uncertainty in your child's life and your family's life. Next slide. There are four different kinds of lupus, including systemic lupus. That's the most common form of lupus and the condition that we'll be talking about today. Cutaneous or skin-limited lupus is less common, but can evolve into the systemic form. Drug-induced lupus happens when a medicine induces the symptoms of lupus, but tends to go away after a period of time after the medication is withdrawn. Neonatal lupus happens when a mother with lupus transfers some of her antibodies to her baby, potentially causing problems with the skin, blood, liver, or heart. So lupus is an autoimmune disease, meaning that your immune system, which keeps you healthy uh, and helps fight off infections, begins to recognize parts of your own body as foreign. Some have described it as an internal war with your own body or friendly fire. The disease did not start right at the time the symptoms developed. It probably took quite a while for the immunologic events to occur that culminated in the lupus developing. Next slide. We know that about 80% of patients with lupus are female, and it most commonly starts after puberty and in early adulthood. It's also more common in Asians, Black, and Hispanic uh, individuals, uh, and we know that heredity plays a role. There's a higher risk of lupus if you have a close relative with the condition. There are about 25,000 children in the US with, with lupus. Next slide. The common symptoms of lupus when it begins are fevers, weight loss, fatigue, a lot of joint pain, rashes, headaches, and swollen glands. In addition to the rashes and arthritis that, that are commonly seen, other areas that are involved are the kidneys, heart, lungs, blood, brain, and other parts of the body, potentially. Next slide. So this, this slide really shows why, why treatment for lupus is so important. The kidney, as I mentioned, is the most common internal organ involved. And this is a picture of the filtering system of the kidneys. In the picture on the left, you can see two large round structures with the arrows, and these are called uh, glomeruli. In those glomeruli, there are too many blue dots, and the blue dots represent the nuclei of cells. And many of these cells that you can see in those glomeruli are immune cells that shouldn't be there and can cause damage to the kidney. In the picture on the right, you see um, the bright green signal um, in that glomerulus, okay? The signal represents antibodies that are stuck in the glomeruli and are causing uh, inflammation in the kidney. Next slide. So you need to get off to the right start uh, to, to, put, um, to institute the right treatments for your, for your lupus. One of the biggest tasks as you confront this new reality is setting up the right team and support system. The rheumatologist is usually the captain of the ship, and there may be other subspecialists like kidney doctors or nephrologists, and other doctors like um, that treat the heart, lungs, blood, brain, or other systems. The primary care physician is often a great partner, for the first line of defense for you. Um, we often utilize social workers uh, who can help you with insurance issues, school adjustment, and a lot of family support. Um, psychologists are, are um, often uh, needed. We're very lucky to have Christina working with us um, at Children's Hospital. Um, and uh, we know that depression and anxiety are very common. Um, in youth with lupus. The school nurse is often helpful with helping with any issues that happen at school. Um, and the family unit is critical. Everyone has to stay healthy and you need to take care of one another. And you even often need to utilize um, uh, the extended family. Um, community organizations 
like the Lupus Foundation or your church or synagogue um, or sports teams, um, anything that you can think of to help you um, will be needed. Next slide. Now, we don't have a cure for lupus, but we have many treatments that are, that are very effective and more on the way. Um, here's a list of the different types of medicines that, that we use. I'm sure you've seen uh, many of these and you're um, uh, coming from the pharmacy and, and that you're using with your child every day. Anti-malarials like hydroxychloroquine, very, very commonly used. Glucocorticoids or steroids, prednisone is the most common. Um, and helps put out the fire very quickly. DMARDs are disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs like mycophenolate, azathioprine, and methotrexate often help um, with what we call steroid sparing, which limits the amount of, of prednisone that you need. Biologic therapies are also becoming um, more commonly used medications such as bulimimab or benlista and rituximab. If your child um, has much more severe lupus, um, sometimes chemotherapy is needed and cyclophosphamide is the medicine that we most commonly use. There are other supportive therapies uh, that are used like blood thinners, blood pressure medicines, acid blockers, calcium and vitamin D for the bones, sunscreen and, and vaccinations, of course. Next slide. So what's the impact on quality of life? We know that quality of life in kids with lupus can be lower um, than their peers. Um, but it kind of depends when you, look at the, when you look at the patients. In this one study that I'm citing here, um, it was with patients with more established lupus with over two years of disease. And the authors noted lower quality of life. Um, and, but that lower health-related quality of life was mainly driven um, by pain, fatigue, and anxiety. Those were the three factors that seem to be most linked. Um, as I mentioned before, we know that depression and anxiety are very common. Um, and there was a, a qualitative study, which was an interview study of about, I think, 40 youth with, with lupus. And the article was entitled, uh, Lupus Means Sacrifices. And a number of themes emerged uh, regarding how lupus affects life during childhood. And the main themes were that there was an impact on identity and self-perception, concern about restricted life decisions, confusion and uncertainty about the diagnosis, treatments, prognosis, and transition to adult care. And sometimes kids resented um, the fact that they needed long-term treatment, unfortunately. Um, next slide. One of the um, uh, questions that came through uh, for this talk was whether lupus is fatal, and I wanted to address that. Um, we know that lupus is unfortunately a very serious disease for many, for many kids. Um, however, today, we know that 10-year survival in countries like the United States is very high, about 97% of 10 years. Um, so that's really good news. However, um, in lower income tr countries, where medical resources may be more scarce, patients struggle a lot more. In those countries, um, survival at 10 years is only 79%. So what this tells me is that lupus is a serious disease, we know that, uh, but it's really important how you access medical care. Um, that is gonna be um, what, you're, what, what um, is really helpful uh, for your child long-term. Uh, next slide. So another question that came through is about the parent or caregiver role. So I wanted to address that too. Um, there are some basics about parenting any child. You still need to pay attention to all the needs that they had before. Uh, but now their physical safety has been threatened. And the most important thing for you to do is work with, with the team uh, to make sure the treatment goes well. Uh, but your kids will also be going through the normal emotional, behavioral, and social development that characterizes mainly adolescence, um, since lupus mainly affects um, teenagers uh, during childhood. I have two teenagers, um, and I know that raising teenagers takes a lot of patience. Um, you still need to foster enough independence long-term to allow them to take care of their own lupus while making sure that all the good things that defined your child before the lupus 
um, still define them now. Um, now I put this picture uh, on this slide for a reason. You've probably all seen this image of putting on your oxygen mask on an airplane. Um, and uh, what I wanted to know, note is that your distress is real. And there will be times um, when you need to put your mask on first, or you need to think about your own well-being, because if you don't think about yourself, it's going to be hard for you um, to think about your kid. Next slide. I wanted to end with a couple of slides with artwork from patients and statements that tell us a lot about coping with lupus. This patient said, two years ago, I learned a name, systemic lupus erythematosus. It became my label, like a fragile stamp on a cardboard box. But I didn't want to be fragile. I wanted to be strong. This statement really emphasizes this idea of identity and how important it is to view lupus as something that one li lives with, but that does not define you. Next slide. Uh, the next painting um, quotes Proverbs and says, she is clothed in dignity and strength, excuse me, in strength and dignity, and she laughs without fear of the future. What a powerful statement. Um, it's very hard to be brave, um, and it's so important as you begin to master this new and unexpected reality. All of us are hoping that your child approaches their condition with the same resilient attitude. Next slide. And here's some contact information um, for our lupus program here at CHOP, as well as our phone number. Um, and I'd like to thank you guys for your attention and thanks for being here. Um, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the, um, of the talk today. Thank you, Dr. Burnham. Wow, that's a, that was really great, a great foundation for us to get started and jump into the, the um, panel discussion and bring our parents on board. Um, just know um, our guests will be putting this information, this contact information into the chat feature. And I'll also bring this up again at the end. So if you're frantically writing it down, don't worry, it'll be into the chat if it's not there already, because um, I'm not looking at the chat. But it, it will also be brought up on a slide at the end of the end of the, the, uh, the webinar as well. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to ask our um, panelists to, to share their screens again. Excellent. Welcome, everybody. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna get started with some introductions, and um, just want to make sure you guys are good to go. I think we have everybody, and um, we'll start. What I'll do is I'll just kind of go around and, and call you guys out so that you can do your do an introduction um, and let everybody know who you are. And um, so, Dr. Burnham, we've already heard from you. So, unless there's anything else you want to add from an intro standpoint. No, I'm just really happy to be here and want to, again, say how grateful I am for this opportunity. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for putting sure. this together. Fantastic. All right, Dr. Christina, Christina Rouse. Hi, I'm Christina Rouse. I'm a pediatric psychologist at CHOP. Um, I work with children with chronic health conditions. Excellent. Linda Vasquez. Hi, um, my name is Linda Vasquez. I am from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, my daughter was diagnosed at the age of 13 with um, systemic lupus, and she is 24 years old uh, today. Oh, it's her birthday. Oh, happy no, birthday. no, no, I meant her oh, age oh, today. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to be 25 in a couple of weeks. So. <laughs> I, think I think we were celebrating her birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Angela. <laughs> Uh, my name is Angela Chapson. I'm a parent from the Philadelphia area. Uh, my daughter was uh, diagnosed with lupus nephritis in 2012, and she is going to be 17 next month. Wonderful. Thanks for joining us. Rodney. I'm Rodney Ross. Uh, I live in Westfield, New Jersey, and uh, I'm the father of Parker, who was diagnosed in 2007 when he was 14. And he's 27 now. Fantastic. Terry, you want to do an introduction? You're on mute. I'm the program director and COO 
at the Lupus Foundation of America in Georgia. And I just love all these accents because I'm a Jersey girl. So I'm loving, <laughs> I'm loving hearing all of this. This is awesome. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, and I realized I don't think I ever introduced myself at the beginning of this program. So my name is Cindy Meserly. I am the CEO of the, the Philadelphia Tri-State Chapter of the Lupus Foundation of America um, and really honored to, to be a part of this, this discussion. Um, so first of all, I want to thank you all for being with us tonight, for sure. Your willingness to share your stories, your experiences, and um, with, with all other parents that are likely, you know, facing or experiencing very similar things that, and challenges that you may have experienced. So thank you for that. Um, just a reminder to our guests, um, we do have the, the chat feature, so if you have any questions, um, we have a, a series of questions and things that we're going to go through and hopefully uh, catch most of your questions through our, our what we've already just um, brought to the table here, but please feel free to um, add anything to the chat and we'll, we'll get those as we can. If for some reason we can't get to all of our questions for time, uh, we, will, uh, we will do our best. To, you can reach out to your local chapter. You can reach out to the Philadelphia Tri-State chapter at info at lupustristate.org, which we will also put up in the chat. And um, so let's get to it. All right. So there's, we're going to, from a panel discussion wise, we're going we're gonna to target each question to a specific panelist, and then we'll open it up to the panel for, for further discussion, just to make sure with this, in this virtual format that we're in, that we're not jumping on each, other, each other's conversations. So there's so much information to wrap your head around once your child has been diagnosed, as you all well know. Doctor's visits, insurance cover, medication, how do you best manage all of this information as a, as a parent? Rodney, how about we start with you? Well, what we found to be helpful um, was picking a scheduling app or a scheduling, um, yeah, well, an app is the best way to describe it. One that will allow you to, that has a lot of flexibility, that will allow you to do recurring events like doctor's appointments and things like that. That was, find one and stick to it but use it for everything. Use it for the doctor's appointments, the, um, the meds, any insurance forms, the deadlines or things like that that you need, but just one, have one app that handles all of that. Then when it comes to meds, of course, find a device that will allow you to uh, separate them out, like put them in, you know, by day. Those are very common. Some of them have gotten a lot more sophisticated and will remind you on your phone when you have to take them. If, you, if that helps, or if you want to um, spend the money for that, I highly recommend that. Anything that will just trigger when, because it's so important that the meds are taken as prescribed. And so having a device that will help you do that is invaluable. What we also found was that for insurance purposes, we just picked one day a week to deal with all the insurance. Uh, we said, okay, we're gonna handle these things on a Tuesday or Wednesday or whatever it is. And then you deal with it on that day, then you don't have to look at it again. But if you try to, if you don't have a schedule for these things, you will get overwhelmed immediately. And particularly with the, with the meds and the doctor's appointments, obviously. So having anything that will help you um, schedule those things and remind you of it in a way that, that that's not too intrusive, but will at least, you know, keep you on a schedule. Just like when they were, when your child was an infant, um, schedules were, were, were crucial. Well, you have to bring them out again. Schedules are going to be very important now that uh, you have to deal with all of the doctor's appointments and the meds. So those are the things that we found to be very helpful in terms of just staying on track. Picking say just one day a week to deal with insurance stuff and then having a really good scheduling app to handle the doctor's appointments and the, uh, and the meds. I like the idea of the one day a week for insurance. That's the, I, have, I haven't put that into place in my own life, but I think that's a really good idea. Anybody else on the, on the group wanna add into that? Um, I would love to add, this is Linda. Um, what I would add, I love those ideas, by the way, <laughs> the, uh, the app to schedule various individuals. Um, but also, um, I would always keep a notebook. Uh, we were in and out of uh, the children's hospital, you know, for many years. And what I found helped me was always having my notebook, always having questions for the doctor, um, when they come in, 
They, you know, we're just one of many that they need to see. And I want to be prepared to make the best use of whatever time we're going to have with them when they make their rounds. Um, also, I would make sure that I understood their answers. Um, I don't have a medical background. Um, so if I didn't understand fully, I would ask for them to explain it to me. If, uh, if I had questions, um, you know, I would ask those questions again from new information they had given me. But um, just always seek to understand what, what they're doing and why they're doing it. Because, you know, there's a lot of people who, as was spoken before, there's, you know, rheumatology, there's psychology, there's, there's different people in the mix that are, that are um, talking to you about your child. So it, the notebook was really a good place for me to be able to keep information and then to make sure that uh, I got the, the questions answered that I wanted. Yeah, terrific. The notebook is a great suggestion because there's still some paper in our world, especially now, you know, so much of our, our technology has gone electronic, electronic medical records, and you have access to likely your health system's portal. And, if, but if you're, if your physicians are not all within the same health system, you may be going from different place to place. So having some of those lab reports and things that you still might get those hard copy, you know, things, insurance EOBs and everything else that you get. Um, it's great to have, you know, a place to keep all that. So, so great tips from, from both of you. Anybody else before we move on? Christina, go for it. I just want to say how much I love it when people bring questions. Um, I usually suggest that families write down all the questions that they have because I know when I go into doctor's visits, I forget to ask everything. It's almost like you go into freeze mode and you don't know how to ask the questions or don't know what questions you want to ask. And so if you have them all written down, you go in and I love it when they just go boom, 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 boom through all their questions. Even if I can't answer them, mm -hmm. I think it's helpful to know what direction to go in and all of that. So more so from the provider side, I love when people have questions. So I think it's helpful. Yeah, in our experience is um, medical personnel or medical staff do a much better job of explaining things to people these days. Um, when I'm saying these days, it, it just, you can just kind of tell that there's a desire, like you were just saying, of imparting that information because it doesn't do anybody any good to keep to be in the dark. The parents can't help, you know, um, as, as much as they should. The other thing I would really like to point out is for the appointments that you're scheduling, be on time. Try as much as possible. I know it's difficult, but just get into the habit of making sure you hit those appointments on time. It makes everybody's life a, a lot uh, easier. There's less stress on both you and the child um, of, you know, of rushing around. But, but the, the notebook idea, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up too, because that was really important. But people shouldn't be uh, hesitant to to ask questions and on the other hand just be on time for your appointments that will make your life a lot easier I think also being on time it's a great point Rodney it also helps us as parents be more settled right so you can be you can you're not racing around trying to get in you had traffic you did this so if you go in a little bit less stressed because you're running behind you're a little bit in a better frame of mind to ask those questions right. um, and I, I also love these days, you know, we have watches, we have phones, we have Alexa, we have all these things that we can say, you know, hey, Siri, add a question to my list for Dr. Burnham or Dr. Rouse, right? right? Hey, Alexa, can you put a, you know, we can tell her to put milk on our grocery list. Why can't we tell her to put a, a something on our list for our doctor's appointment, right? So we can, we have these tools that, that people have access to uh, making creative use of them. So, so great thoughts. Anybody else? All right, we'll move on. Okay, next question. Uh, a child with lupus likely has several doctors and specialists, as we, we heard Dr. Burnham share. Um, who do you call for what? Dr. Burnham, let's start with you on this. What if your child wakes up with a fever, a cold? Do you call the rheumatologist? Do you call the primary care? Do I call urgent care? Do I send them to school anyway? You know, wh who are we calling at this point now? I don't, I'm not even sure who to go to. Right, so usually, usually the rheumatologist, as I mentioned, is the captain of the ship for, for the lupus. Now, if you're sure that, that your kid has an ear infection, 
you know, they went swimming and, and their ear is draining, that's a really good thing for your primary care physician. Um, if they have their lupus rash, you should call the rheumatologist most likely. Um, um, if they have a fever, um, again, it kind of depends on how serious the lupus is. Um, if a fever has been a part of the lupus or if your child is on immunosuppressive medicines, really good to let the rheumatologist know. Now, if they have fever and a sore throat and, and your other child is sick too, that, that can be something that the pediatrician takes care of. Um, this is always good to discuss with, with whoever is in charge of the lupus care, um, usually the rheumatologist. From my standpoint, I never mind uh, when a family calls um, with a concern about their child. Um, that's the safest thing is to let us know. We can always refer you to your primary care physician. As parents, how do you guys struggle with that? Angela, do you struggle with that? Who to call? What to, have you gotten into it? You're a little bit newer in the diagnosis than Rodney and Linda as parents. Have you settled into a place where you go, all right, this is lupus or nope, this is a cold. You know, this is who we call. All right. I, I must say in the beginning, it was very difficult to know who to call. And it depends. Yeah. So in the beginning, when um, my daughter was going through the chemo and those sort of treatments, um, especially when she had a fever or had nausea, I would, I would go to the, the rheumatologist first. Um, but then as she came off the chemo and, you know, she was, I guess, settling in to what her normal routine was, um, I, would, I would contact the pediatrician, especially if it's, I would contact the pediatrician first. And, but our pediatrician has a really good relationship with us and with rheumatology. So that's really helpful too. So I think it depends on where you are with your care. Um, in the beginning, when you're not sure, I would, I just there on the, I just went to the rheumatologist. I mean, her hair was falling out. She was, you know, having all sorts of nausea, that sort of thing. So that was like a rheumatologist thing. Yeah. But as you know, but as, as she was, you know, getting better, I would go, I would be more comfortable going to a pediatrician first. And I, trusted, and I also trusted the pediatrician That's to important. know that she, she would refer me to the rheumatologist if she wasn't sure. So. And in, in today, just one more thing, like in today's world with the portals that, that Cindy mentioned, like if you decide to go to your pediatrician uh, that you're pretty confident it's a regular, regular kid thing, you can just send an FYI um, to your rheumatologist, hey, this is going on, just wanted to let you know. Mm -hmm. um, and if they're worried, they'll, they'll let you know. Definitely one of the benefits of our technology these days and, and having multiple physicians being able to access different, um, even being able to connect through different, um, different hospital systems into this, to a similar portal, being able to access information and lab work and stuff is really helpful from a parent standpoint of not having to share all that information too, which is great. Mm -hmm. and, and on that same line, how do you make doctor's visits less difficult? You know, especially if your child's di uh, you know, diagnosed at a younger age, it's challenging, or even in those teenagers, the last thing they want to do is go to the doctors, or you have a lot of doctors to go to. They've got life they want to live. How do you make that stuff less challenging as a parent? Angela, did you have any success sure. with that? So I think the key is to reduce anxiety and stress for your child. Um, so one way we found is that, you know, to prepare them to know what to expect at your visit. So give them an idea what's going on. Um, you know, sometimes in the beginning she would have like day meds. So she would have to have like the chemo treatment. So we would have to be prepared for that, um, you know, bring activities, that sort of thing. Um, so just knowing what's going to happen at the appointment was helpful. And then also streamlining appointments, like follow-up appointments. We had to see a rheumatologist and a nephrologist with every um, follow-up visit. So I think it's really, it, it really helped to make sure that you see the rheumatologist and the nephrologist on the same day. In the beginning, um, we weren't as fortunate to have this uh, integrated clinic that Dr. Burnham has uh, set up. So um, I would go, you know, I'd have to go in one day to see the rheumatologist and then maybe a week la later to go see the nephrologist. Um, eventually, we were able to sync up the appointments, but I think that's really helpful because I, my daughter hates it when she has to miss school, and that like just causes a lot of stress and anxiety for her. So just to be able to you know, say, we're just going to get it all done on this one day. Usually, I try to do it on Friday, so it's like right before the weekend. Um, I think it's just helpful. 
and then, you know, always go for a treat after your appointment. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> Can I say something, Cindy? Of Just course. tag on to that treat. That's what I was going to say. Have, have something else other than the doctor's visit or, um, you know, the hospital. Have something, any little treat. You know, if we were able to, we would sneak in lunch, you know, or we would, you know, if we were there really late, um, we do dinner before we got back into the commute traffic. Um, or, you know, her favorite, one of her favorite clothing stores was right by, right by Choa. So, uh, you know, once in a blue moon, just a little treat. It, it, it makes a big difference. And it also gives you as parents a little of that down quality time that's yes. not driven around doctor's offices and visits and blood work and everything else that is such a part of, of a diagnosis. So it's a fun time between you and your child too, which is nice. Excellent. And along those lines, Angela, you brought up something here. Um, and actually somebody posted in the chat um, how they try to settle their, their child's anxiety around doctor's office and hob hobbies and things like that. Um, what are some, Christina, maybe we'll go to you first on this. What are, and this is, sorry, this is a little surprise. What are some ways to help reduce a child's anxiety through all of that, right? There's a lot of things that the child gets anxious about. The doctor's office may be one of them, as Angela mentioned. It could be, you know, getting into a flare, all of that. What are some tips on, on reducing your child's anxiety? Um, so actually, I was going to pipe in earlier and say that you guys are going to think I'm a broken record by the end of this, but one of the things that I love to tell parents is to validate. Um, sometimes you think like just telling a kid like you have every right to be anxious about this seems like, oh, that might make them more anxious, but it actually does make them feel like it's okay to feel that way. Because a lot of the times they're trying to be strong, they're trying to get through things, they're trying to not feel overwhelmed and or miss school and things like that. And I might say something like, you know what, I'd be upset if I had to miss school too. Or yeah, it's really frustrating when you have all that makeup work to do. So I, I wanted to add that in because validation is such a strong part of what I do because it helps kids feel like it's okay. Even though I can't control anything that's happening right now, I feel okay. So going into the anxiety piece and just the difficulties with managing and coping with the diagnosis. I agree with the hobbies piece. I think really bringing in things that kids love to do, um, whether it's when they're in the appointments or before, kind of scheduling things around, um, especially when it comes, I might be going off a little bit and you can tell me if this is going into other questions, but um, I like writing down plans. So for example, I had this one girl who hated blood work. And so she had to get blood work a lot. And so we called it the Panda Plan. She came up with the plan herself. She's the one that created all the different things that she would do right before she got the blood work done. And so in that way, she felt like she was more in control. And I, anxiety is that fear of losing control. It's not having control over your medical diagnoses, your medication, your doctor's appointments. And anytime we can help a child feel like they're the ones in control, that's when you're going to start to see the reduction of anxiety. So I can elaborate more if you want, but I don't want to take too much time. But that's basically in a nutshell what no, I like. That's, that's some great tips for sure. Um, anybody else's parents, have you, did you have a trick that alleviated the anxiety that worked for your child? Well, I think that's very important to validate um, to validate what, what they are feeling. What we told our son was that we recognized that he got dealt a very bad hand, you know, just in terms of just in life, this happened. However, his mom and I were going to be there every step of the way. We're going to give him as much support as possible, but it's okay to be, um, you know, to, to, to be uh, upset about this or, um, mad or all of those emotions, not suppressing them, I think is, is very important, but also letting him know or letting your child know that, that you will be there for them in terms of, uh, as much support and as much help and go through this together as much as you can. I think really letting them know, and then trying to have as normal a life as possible, but letting them know that yes, you recognize this, but at the same time, you know, that's what families are for to get through it. Uh, and we found that to be helpful. Excellent. 
I would just add on to what Rodney uh, said. We would, we would do the same thing. And when she was just breaking down and just having one of those days where, you know, she, she's being told you have to go back to the hospital again and she's screaming, no, I don't want to. And um, just trying to calm, calm her down and, and, and again, um, validate her feelings that, yeah, you know, you're right to be angry. You're right to have these feelings, but also we need to do what's best for you. And that's mm -hmm. what we're all here to do is to help you. And as Rodney said, I can't uh, say it enough. We're here for you. When you are falling down and you can't get up from the fact that you're exhausted and just so frustrated that you do everything you're being told to do and it's not working. Mom and or dad will be there to physically lift you off the floor and take you and be that support for you when you can't do it yourself. Well said, well said. And Angela, you mentioned something there um, that, you know, obviously um, your daughter went through chemotherapy, she lost her hair. There's a lot of medications involved, especially maybe early on in a diagnosis if you're in a major flare, which has caused the diagnosis. And then they may wean down a little bit, but you know, there's, that's a lot of medication. Those are heavy medications, right? And, and there's ongoing medication throughout their life. And especially as a, as a younger child, maybe, you know, a younger adolescent being diagnosed, uh, anybody experience challenges with their with their child taking medicine, getting them to to get on the routine, the constant reminders? Oh my gosh, you know, I'm I'm sure as as parents, it's a it's horrible to have to constantly remind somebody to have to do something. Let alone the, the on being on the your child's end of the constant. Did you take your medicine? Did you take your medicine? Did you take you know? How did you get around that? Are there any challenges that you experienced through that? Well, I must say it might have been a blessing that she was only eight years old when she was diagnosed because she just knew to listen to me. <laughs> it wasn't like at the rebellious teenage stage where she knows better, but somehow she learned through the whole process and what we we're going through. And maybe it's just, maybe just being, you know, a patient, you become more mature or something, but she, she looked at it as life and death. So she knew that if she didn't take the medicine, that she would not be getting better and it could end very badly for her. So somehow, and I don't know if it's like, I'm not really sure how she figured that, all that out. So I never really got pushed back on the medicine. And she went through all kinds of side effects too. So, I mean, I think it may have been harder as a teenager, honestly, right? Mm -hmm. And Rodney and Linda, you might know better um, yeah. and, but to this day, like she's very conscientious about taking her meds. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was very, well, am very lucky that she's always been a very conscientious, um, individual with school as your daughter. It sounds like, you know, they hate the fact that they've got to miss school, that they want to be in school rather than be at a doctor's appointment or in the hospital. But, um, she was she was very responsible and she list, she listened. So, you know, thankfully we didn't have a big issue on getting her to take them. Um, but what made things easier was those, the, these, uh, I think Rodney mentioned it, the pill, individual pill carriers or organization for the pills. Yep. And, um, and even in the last two years, we, we just found them where there's, they get smaller, it's more manageable, more discreet for her. You're able to just carry what you need for the day. And then when you come home, you put it back into the, you know, the week long organization of, of pills you have, but um, that helps a lot. Totally agree, Linda. Um, when she was first diagnosed, we had a neighbor and um, she introduced us to a friend who actually had lupus also. And she gave her this decorated pill box where like, it's for arthritic pa patients where you push the buttons. You know, being an eight-year-old girl, it was like all glammed up with all the jewels and stuff. Like she, right. she really liked it and we still use it to this day. Wow, that's I awesome. Mean, it's yeah. like almost nine years old and she still has it. <laughs> well, I love 
love what you just said there. It was all glammed up. You'd be dazzling. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like yeah. gaudy. It's, a, it's really gaudy. That's, that's it has like so jewels funny. everywhere. And yeah, and it's lost a couple jewels now, but you know, nine years later, we're still using the same pillbox. That's amazing. Awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> but, but little tricks, right? It's fun. It's something, it's something mm -hmm. different. And, you know, we do whatever we can as parents to make things happen, right? Right. Um, but, but that's kind of fun. Um, so, Christine, I'm going to come to you with this one. Um, how does a parent manage their own fears about their child's diagnosis while still being that caring, positive, you know, person and such an important person in their child's life, but having these, these very true and real fears? Something that I'm pretty frank about, especially when I work with parents, is um, it's, it's really hard to go through all of this, and obviously you can't express to your child fully like what your fears are about their health and the outlook of things and things like that. And I, I really stress that it's not a sign of weakness if you do need to go talk to somebody. Um, so if you need to go see your own therapist, if you need to meet with the doctors on your own, just to express your own concerns, I think it, it's a sign of strength that helps people. It helps you. Um, it's funny that um, Dr. Burnham did the uh, face mask thing because I say that all the time when I work with parents is you're not going to be very effective if you're trying to always put out the fires. You got to put your face mask on first. And so by putting your face mask on first, by, you know, taking care of yourself, even if it's not therapy, it can be making sure you still have time for yourself. Even if it's just some parents, they tell me they have zero time. I say, you know, if you sit for five minutes with your cup of coffee in the morning and just take that time just for you, or if everyone's in bed and then you can just sit on the couch in complete silence and just relax, make sure that you're also taking your own time for self-care because we do forget about ourselves. We want to do the, you want to do the best for your child. You want to be there for them. And what we have to remember is you're going to run out of steam if you're not careful and you don't want that to happen. So whatever you need to do to also take care of yourself, whether it's friends, family, or even just yourself, I highly recommend it. I tell parents to take care of themselves. Yeah. So important, so important. And, you know, all, Linda, Ronnie, Angela, you've all been in this for a while, right? So, you know, even as still as young as, as your daughter is, Angela, she, she was eight when you were diagnosed, when she was diagnosed. So it's, it's, you've been in it for a long haul. Have you guys found any tricks to, to, to force that self-care on yourself, right? Because sometimes we have to force it on ourselves, no doubt. <laughs> family. Lean on family. You Good know? point. Just find a family member, um, and they're all, they're all more than willing. Just ask. My problem is I don't ask. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I don't want to have to burden someone else to give me time or, and I shouldn't use the word burden, but impede on someone else's time, asking them to do me a favor. That's always been hard for me. So, um, yeah, I, I go to family. Very nice. Yeah, family's so important. Um, well, for obvious reasons. We found, or I found that uh, j just having an activity, something you could do, it doesn't take a lot, a lot of time but just something you can do that's just a you thing, whatever it is. It could be um, a fantasy football league or, or uh, I play golf. Uh, just something that you can do that's short duration, but you can kind of just leave everything alone for a few hours. That's a great recharger. Your child will love it because you're not going to be frazzled and freaked out and... Uh, you know, they don't, and if you remember when they were infants, uh, they liked order. And that's the same way when they get older. I mean, if they think that you're not in control, that's going to give them more anxiety. And if having an outlet helps you to become more in control, that's all to the good for your child. Mm -hmm. Nice. All right, we're going to switch gears just slightly. We're going to take it to the like the school, the social aspect of a lupus diagnosis for, for your children. Um, how did you talk to your, or how do you talk to your child's school or friends? That social aspect about your diagnosis, you know, whether it's a new diagnosis or when it was a new diagnosis, 
um, or something that's maybe gone to, to a next level. It's gotten a little bit more extreme, if, you know, if that be the case. How did you address that? Angela, let's go to you first on that. Sure. So um, I must say when she was initially diagnosed, she's going into third grade and we probably wouldn't have said anything to the school right away. But the fact that she was going through treatment, the high dose steroids, and she had a lot of physical changes. So she had the like huge weight gain, she was losing her hair. Um, so we it was kind of unavoidable. We had to tell the school what was going on. And we also wanted them to know. I mean, so we met with the principal, the school counselor, and um, her teacher, just to get them on board, to let them know what she was going through and what we'd be dealing with this year. Um, so we actually, and we also reached out to the LFA actually, and the LFA was really helpful and they, um, they actually put together a program for, for the school. So they actually helped us educate everyone in the elementary school from kindergarten through fourth grade, and, you know, in a kid-friendly way, like what is lupus, you know, so, and it's just, just to bring awareness to this disease. And um, we actually did a little fundraiser at the school as well. So we had like a little walk. So, I mean, by third grade, I mean, she has friends, but it's a little different than like if you're a teenager and you're telling your friends. So this was kind of a way to like just bring the whole school on board. And um, so it was kind of a fun activity. You know, everybody was involved. And um, so it was really helpful. And then we ended up doing the LFA walk in Philadelphia that year. And we had like over 80 people come with us, including family, friends, her school friends, and some teachers. So that was kind of how we, we introduced it to, you know, her school community. Nice. It's great to get the whole school community involved too. Right? Yeah. Cause I mean, a lot of people don't know about the disease and then you find out people are like, Oh, I do know someone with lupus, you know, and that just makes it a little bit more, you know, I guess understandable or, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Linda, Rodney, how'd you tell, how'd you deal with um, that? Most school districts or most states have IEPs, the Individual Educational Program. New Jersey has one that we think, well, I think it, it was actually really good. Um, Parker, our son had his, uh, he missed most of the last year of his middle school and all of the first year of his high school. So he was um, taught at home, but then he was able to go back and be integrated into the school with an IEP, you know, after that. That's incredibly important. Um, he had a core group of friends. And one of the things I have to say, and many parents realize this, it's the sad part about having a child with a chronic disease is you and your child will know immediately who your friends are. You know, it just, that's just the way it happens. You know, um, trying to combat the fact that lupus is not, um, not contagious, um, you know, things like that. So you, you get past all of that, but let's, you know, the, the bottom line is that you learn quickly who your friends are, um, who your child's friends are, my son was lucky because the friends that he had, this core group of friends that he had when he was 14, he still has. And they are very close. And they understand his disease and they understand what he's going through. But he still had, even before the uh, pandemic, he had um, a decent social life in terms of you know going out and going to movies and doing things like that with his friends. But they're a core group of friends, they understand. And, and the school did too, because the schools again have done, and I think have done a really good job in terms of uh, demystifying certain things about, about kids and their diseases. In the class that he was in, they had a teacher and a, um, I don't wanna call them a teacher's aide because they were more than that, but uh, that dealt with the IEP part. So they had children with different degrees of disabilities. They were all in the same classroom. And, and I went on a field trip with them once and how those kids interacted with each other was amazing. So that part was very gratifying, very heartwarming. But having that core group of, of friends is important. The ones that understand what your child is going through is important. Um, 
you will have them, you will find them, whether it's two, 10, or, you know, however many it is, those will be the ones that um, will help you get through this and help your child get through through this because they'll give give your child as much of a degree of normalcy as possible. I guess that's what I'm, I'm trying to say, and mm -hmm. that's important. Mm -hmm. So true. I would just add um, my experience with the school system uh, down here in the suburbs of Atlanta, um, the IEP existed, but I had to go and find it. Mm -hmm. I had to be the one to seek out information. I had to, you know, seek out, you know, talking with the guidance counselor. I had to, it, it wasn't, um, it was, it was something I felt her school just didn't deal with. I, I felt like it was a whole new thing, although it existed at the county level, you know, the IEPs and all that stuff. And we did, we did all that, but I don't feel we had as good of an, ex, as, as much support from the school um, as the other two, as Angela and Rod, Rodney had. And again, though, Alexa was uh, first year high school when she was, started having real problems. So for a young girl, that's, it's just such a tough age. Right. And, you know, going into high school and Angela, she was, she was having the hair loss, the chipmunk cheeks, as we call it, um, going through all that. Uh, I, I got to a point where she wore a wig, you know, we, we actually went and, and had her fitted for a wig and such to, to help her. But um, yeah, she doesn't view her high school years very fondly. She had to, her love, she loved playing softball. Mm -hmm. She had to stop playing softball. Platelets are too low. You can't, can't take the chance. And then it just went on from there. So, um, right. so yeah, so it's, I'm thankful to hear that there are good stories out there, you know, but yeah. then there's, there's, there's some like ours too, mm -hmm. where the parent, I just find throughout this, throughout all the years, um, we have to be our children's advocate. You know, there is no one else who's going to do what we're going to do. Um, and, you know, rightly so. Um, but I just see the need for advocates out there for, for children when you're in the hospital with your child, you know, and you see, you know, not everybody can be there with their child the way I was able to, you know, so, um, so I just feel just real strongly about being an advocate and, and trying to help others, you know, with, you know, information. I think the advocacy point is that, yeah, Christina, go, I'll go to you first. Um, the only thing I was going to say, I really agree with what Rodney and Linda said about just understanding their children. But um, one of the things that I've really seen a lot in my sessions with kids is the amount of questions they get from peers, even if it's not something, it's one of those things where we want to ask them like how much they want to be shared. Um, I think that the parents that have talked thus far, like they're absolutely spot on with their children about how comfortable they are with what they want to share with everybody. Um, and so what I usually try and figure out is like, for example, I have some kids that say, I'm really tired of explaining to people why I'm going to the hospital so much, or I'm really sick and tired of people always asking me, like, what's wrong with my face, or why I'm putting on weight, or why this is happening to me. And so sometimes I come up with the kids in the session a script of how much you're willing to share, how you want to explain it. Like, for example, if you don't want them to know anything at all, we come up with a script. It's, thank you for your concern. I don't want to talk about it. And I feel like kids can then start to advocate for themselves as well. But once you have that script, it helps them feel less anxious when they're in the situation because kids are nosy, kids are bullies. And it's really hard when you're in that situation. And that's something that I deal with probably on a more frequent basis nowadays is kids just constantly ask questions about kids like medical conditions and why they're out of the school. And I just feel like so strongly that it's so important to get what they feel most comfortable with in those situations. And again, I think everyone so far has really hit the nail on the head with being able to meet their child where they're at and advocate for them. I really agree with that point. Yeah, I love, you know, providing, providing your child with the tools of whatever they may face and however they may face it, whatever they're comfortable with. 
um, is arming them and then supporting them through that. I think that's, that's, that's a great, amazing tip um, for sure. And, you know, that, uh, Linda, you led us into one of our other questions here when you talked about um, your daughter playing softball. You know, there's the whole challenge of, well, obviously right now we're not doing much, but, you know, when we get back into, and before, we'll call it BC, before COVID, um, you know, we're, we worry about our kids to begin with. We worry about them getting hurt and injured and infections and things like that. Uh, but now you've got a child with a, with a potentially compromised immune system, right, with an autoimmune disease. Um, they're on medications, and it may cause enough anxiety for the child through that. But how do you know when to draw the line of participating in sports because they might get hurt or they might, or doing a sleepover because they're already tired, and we all know as parents what sleepovers do to kids, right? They're exhausted for days afterwards and a good day. And now you add in, you know, a, an autoimmune disease. Um, Christina, I'll, I'll start with you on that. How do we, you know, sometimes you feel like you're darned if you do and darned if you don't, right? The kid's going to, your child's going to be upset because you're not going to let them go to the sleepover, but you know what's going to happen after the sleepover. So where do we draw the line? Oh, it's so context-based. That's such a good question. Um, but I think it's really just being honest with them. So for example, with like all the things happening nowadays, I've had some kids that were like, I really want to go play soccer, but I'm really scared to go do that because of everything that's going on. And even before COVID, it's like you said, are they, should they be doing this? Should they not be doing this? And sometimes it's sitting down and saying, what do we want our outcome to be? So for example, do we want you feeling better at the end of it? Do we know what it's going to look like when this happens? Yes, in the very moment we want these things, but we know that the outcome is going to be this if you do it. Um, I almost call it like my ABC chart. So the A is like always the same. It's the, okay, this is what's going to happen. B is what you choose to do and C is the consequence. How do we pick our desired consequence? And so then it becomes, I know that that's not what you actually want to do, but this is what's going to help you be okay in the end. And so I think it's also, I'm sure the parents can probably speak to this more than I could. It's not always going to be the one that you want and you're not always going to get a kid going, absolutely, that sounds like a great, they're going to be like, they're going to be angry. So like, I think that's also something too, where you, you sit back and you go, I'm sorry, you're upset, validate. And, um, but we want the better outcome in this situation. I know it's not the one that you wanted. <laughs> yeah. All right, parents, tell us, see, you've experienced it, I'm sure. Yeah, it was really no different than most of the, well, it, it, the difference is the chronic disease part, but it's, it's the same thing. Well, I'll, I'll talk from adolescence because that's when um, Parker was diagnosed. They're the same type of conversations you would have on almost anything about the, the you know, the, the actions have consequences. You can do this, and if you do this, this will, this will happen. So you have to ask yourself, how different will my life, if I do this, how different will my life be an hour from now, tomorrow morning, a week from now? That was the conversation we had with like drugs and sex, you know, just, you know, when he was, before he was diagnosed, you had that, that conversation, your actions have consequences. Once he was diagnosed, it's interesting that the, that the sleepover part came up because sometimes, you know, you have to weigh the, you know, the, the, the desire to do it, let them do it, and then see here's the consequence because it's not, if, as long as it's not really threatening their health, if it's just a matter of, you know, they're going to be knocked out the next day. Well, suppose the next day, they were supposed to study something or they had to do something. Well, you still have to do it because you chose to do this doesn't mean that the thing you were supposed to do is going to get postponed because that was the choice you made. So they're all life lessons and they're all, you just incorporate the, the, the fact that they have this chronic disease. And it's the same thing with the meds that we discussed earlier. If you don't take the meds, this is what's going to happen. Um, and, we didn't have, we really, with the meds, we didn't really have a problem. There was a short period of time when he was, when he was uh, reluctant to take them or didn't take them. Then we had to take over again and do it. And then, you know, he just, he just got into the habit of doing it. But most of these things are things you would discuss with your child anyway, without, I mean, just the, the normal parenting that you would do, um, you know, as they go through adolescence, you know, young adults and adolescents. It's, it's really not that different. 
That's a good point. And it is because those, those are tough conversations, whether or not there's a chronic disease involved or not. And, and we, as parents, we're typically the bad guy anyway, right? So <laughs> whether or not there's another factor involved. <laughs> um, and uh, Dr. Burton, I'm going to go to you on this one. Uh, we're obviously in the middle of a global pandemic, as we, as we say, and it's rocked all of our worlds. Um, over these last six months, and, and it appears that we're going to be in this for at least the foreseeable future, at least a few more months, um, that, and, and if not beyond, um, we, we really don't know. But from a medical perspective, what recommendations do you have to parents or things that, that parents should be concerned about having a child with a, with a chronic autoimmune disease, lupus, right? Um, possibly a suppressed immune system and everything else. Um, it's obviously a, a big question. Schools are sometimes going back, some are going back, they're hybrid, they're this, they're that, um, and some kids have the choice whether to go back or not. Uh, what would you recommend to parents? I know it's a, it's a pretty broad question, but there, there's a lot of concern out there, obviously, around COVID and, and living with lupus. Yeah, um, we're still, believe it or not, um, six, seven months into this, it's still pretty early. Um, in the COVID pandemic, we still have a lot to learn. Um, what I can say is that, you know, CHOP is a pretty big center. Um, we have over 100 patients with lupus in our practice. Uh, we have had a few lupus patients who have developed COVID, but it's mainly been found incidentally. So for example, there was a child who needed a procedure to be done and you had to get pre-procedure COVID testing, and it was, it, it was discovered that she had COVID, she's on a lot of immun immunosuppression. And she said, you know, I was maybe a little short of breath, but, but that's about it. And she was fine. And that's generally been our experience so far with COVID in our pediatric population. It's been, if there's been any silver lining to this whole experience, it's been how well um, the kids with rheumatic diseases have done. We're not sure how many have gotten it, but what I can say is that there hasn't been a single patient in our practice uh, who's been hospitalized with COVID. And that's really, I mean, if you had told me that six months ago, I think I would have been pretty surprised. Um, you know, we have kids who get hospitalized with influenza with some frequency. Um, so, um, you know, we're not quite sure yet, but but I'd rather be younger than old. I'd rather be younger than older, um, uh, uh, if you get COVID. Um, so that said, uh, we don't know what the future is. If you're on really significant immunosuppression and high dose steroids, it might be a little bit of a different story. Um, but listen, you got to use your your hand hygiene. You've got to wear your mask. Um, every family needs to make their own decision about what's right for not only their kid with lupus, but for their whole family and extended family. Um, we're trying to just support families as much as we can in whatever decision that they make about school. Yeah, it's not an easy decision for sure. And I think um, I do, I, I, I love the statistics that you're sharing. That's great news that that the, the few patients who have gotten it, right, have not been severe and it's been caught incidentally kind of thing. So um, that's, that's a really good thing to hear. That's a very positive outcome from that, um, from so, certainly some of the other stories that we hear in the news and things like that. So um, any other parents, uh, any, anything else you wanna share as far as your challenges, whether it's with school age kids or adult, you know, you've got adult children out there um, potentially working, you know, doing different things. How are you handling it? Uh, well, our son moved. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead, Rodney. You go. Um, our son was living in Philadelphia, going to grad school, and well, this was well before the pandemic. Had moved back home because he had a, a severe uh, setback, and when he got out of the hospital this sec this third time, second time, he just moved back home, and he's been home with us since. So, in a way, the pandemic puts it's like everybody has to or those people who are paying attention have to you know take precautions so i'm i'm uh how can i put this when he when he has to go out in public the fact that 
like he has to come down to, to UPenn to go to, um, we have to be down there in fact Tuesday because he has to go see his wound care doctor and his, not his rheumatologist, his um, dermatologist. And <laughs> when we go down, we get masked up. We have the, the gloves on, the mask on. He's got goggles because we're not taking any chances. And we go into Pearlstein Center and he goes and sees his doctors and we go back out and we get in the car and we go home. And we haven't really had any, any problem doing it. So the pandemic has kind of like leveled the playing field for everybody having to, to, to be careful about these things. Prior to that, we just had to be very careful about what, uh, prior to the pandemic, about what he um, was exposed to. He had to, and we, he was living by himself, but he was, I mean, with two other roommates in an apartment, you know, in Philadelphia, and I would yeah. go down there every month and I would tell him, you know, you got to keep this bathroom clean or, you know, that, that kind of thing. But there was three guys living in an apartment. Yeah. And I was just, you know, you can only get so mad about it, about keep the bathroom clean because you all are going to get strep or something in here. Um, but, you know, that was one of the other things he kind of had to learn the hard way. And uh, uh, but now we're, we're all three of us are here and we're pretty much, you know, in the house, you just go out for groceries and, and, and things of that nature for the duration. So I don't know what everybody else's experience is. But like I said, it's kind of interesting that that the pandemic hit and that uh, people kind of experiencing what people with chronic diseases or autoimmune diseases go through on a daily basis. Mindy, you wanted to share? Yeah, um, I was just going to say, um, my daughter moved to Philadelphia a year and a half ago as well. And then um, the, uh, the pandemic hit and everybody was sent home to work from home so she came back to Georgia and she's working from home, but for, you know, for her job up there in Philly. And um, down here, it's a little more lax, <laughs> um, we find, but we're diligent about putting our masks on and taking the precautions, um, even though, you know, when we walk out of this house or wherever we have to go, um, it's not, uh, it's not always the case. You see, you know, uh, some, probably 60% with masks and then 40% without. And we're saying we just need to protect ourselves as best as we can and just, you know, stay out of large, you know, gatherings and things like that. And, and we've had to um, not attend certain, you know, family functions that that were st still happening just because we will not take that ch we won't take that chance so um and they're you know they're understanding but um so we kind of face that down here you know people are st you know still you know having some gatherings and things like that and you have to make the choice to say you know what thank you but i can't afford to not be safe and to go put myself in that situation, you know, especially more now that she's uh, returned to, it's, it's a blessing in disguise, the pandemic and her coming back home uh, to work from here because um, she's ended up having to go back on dialysis. And, um, and we're working through that and now we're working with all of her doctors at um, Emory University Hospital down here and she's very close to getting back on the transplant list and we do have a living donor so um, you know things happen th certain things happen for a reason you got to think you know whatever you believe in there's something greater out there that says you need to go home <laughs> you know? so well, unfortunately, we've, we've run us, run us over our one hour webinar series here, but um, I think this, uh, certainly the extra 15 minutes has been amazing. And I, I trust that we could continue this conversation for hours on end. Oh, yeah. Sure, with, with, with the dialogue and the questions and support. So I want to thank you all um, from on behalf of the, all of the chapters of the, of the Lupus Foundation of America for supporting um, this program and for attending, for sharing your experiences and your lupus journey 
and um, it looks like I might have a little unstable connection. So if I get bumpy, I'm sorry. Um, and so, but thank you from, from sharing really personal experiences about um, what you witnessed with your children. Uh, Dr. Burnham, Dr. Rouse for sharing your, your medical uh, expertise with us. We so appreciate it. There's one last thing I wanna share real quick and I'm gonna share my screen. All right, and I just want to give you a heads up about a uh, parent support group that happens um, that the Georgia chapter has put together. Thank you, Linda, for being one of the founders and, and facilitators of this program, the Lupus Parent Project. And um, if you are interested in, in really connecting with other parents who are living with children, obviously have children living with lupus, and a little bit of a support network, um, please reach out. You can find their information here. Uh, we'll also put this up in the chat and um but the georgia chapter and they are they do meet virtually so it's just another resource for parents out there uh to to connect which is really important and then i want to share back with you one more time the chop information on connecting with chop again this is in your chat so you'll see it there uh, but feel free to reach out to your local lfa chapter if you have additional questions if you'd like to if you're like here in the, in the philadelphia region and you'd like to connect with with chop and their rheumatology team, please feel free. Um, and here is our local. So on behalf of the Philadelphia Tri-State Chapter and all of the chapters of the Lupus Foundation of America, thank you for joining us. Uh, panel, Dr. Burnham, Dr. Rouse, Rodney, Linda, and uh, Angela, uh, thank you so much for your participation and for joining us. And I wish you all the best and stay safe. Thank you, you as well. Thank you. Thank you.